Well, we've made it through a month of Reformation sermons, and and now we're going back to the disciples, the never-ending disciple sermon series. And uh, this week, uh, we're going to Peter, and next week is the last one. We'll, we'll end with Judas. Uh, I'll be honest, I, I didn't really want to preach on Peter. Peter gets a lot of time. There's, uh, I think, 155 mentions of Peter in the New Testament. We hit on Peter a lot in lectionary and passages, so I thought, well, can't we just leave him out? But I had a number of you come up to me and say, when's Peter? Come on, Mac, get to Peter. So reluctantly, I have uh, included Peter, although uh, there's a lot that actually the lectionary doesn't touch um, about Peter, particularly in uh, the Acts of the Apostles, and Paul hits on Peter in Galatians. And so uh, there is always more that we can learn from the disciple Peter. Our second uh, text today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Hopefully you've seen by now that our liturgy is filled with stories of Peter, and that will continue after the sermon as well. Listen for the Spirit's movement in these words. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, The wind ceased, and those on the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God, the Word of the Lord. Let us pray. Thanks be to you, O God, for the image of one who is trusting enough in the midst of a storm in a boat to say, if it's you, call me out. Thanks be to you, O God, also for the image of the one who realizes what's going on and begins to sink and says to Jesus, save me. For in the image of Peter, we certainly see ourselves, our courage, our fear, our sense of adventure, and our sense of reluctance. Thanks be to you, O God, for your word and your stories, and all God's people shall say. So I just know a ton of you have recently visited the Vatican website. Show of hands. Oh, come on. Really? (laughs) What I thought. So I visited the Vatican website for the first time in my life this week. Uh, I, uh, uh, I was reading about Peter, 
And in my reading, the topic of uh, St. Peter's Basilica came up. And uh, so I, uh, one thing led to another. And as I was studying about Peter's burial, uh, I, I went to the, the Vatican website. And sure enough, they have this amazing interactive tour where you can go down below the layers of St. Peter's Basilica and eventually get down to the place where they believe that Peter, Peter's remains are. And it's a wonderful virtual tour, absolutely free if you've never been to Rome. Uh, and my understanding is to get down to Peter's remains, you actually have to be Catholic clergy or a nun. And so it's not open to the public, but you can go to the Vatican website and uh, get a tour of this. And it's absolutely fascinating. You see, Peter's body was laid to rest in what is known or was known as the Vatican field in the late 60s, not the 1960s, but 60 CE, or a little after that time during the reign of Nero. Uh, a Roman historian, Tacitus, describes the area as a notoriously pestilent neighborhood, this area where uh, Peter's body was laid to rest. It, uh, it was a place where Nero often oversaw a series of brutal executions. And gradually, after Peter was buried, others were buried there. Uh, you see, at that time, you couldn't be buried inside the walls of Rome. You had to be buried outside of the walls. And it was not just Christians who were buried around Peter, but it was pagan burials as well. In 330, when Christianity under Constantine began to get, get favor within the Roman Empire, Constantine built his own basilica on Vatican Hill and covered this, what was already a burial area. And by 1626, uh, the present uh, St. Peter's Basilica was built. In 1939, I think it was Pope Pius VI or VII, had an idea. He wanted to begin to do excavation to see if they could find where St. Peter's bones were. An interesting project to take on um, after years and years of lore, of, of building all of this on top of what they thought was Peter's burial area, uh, area. Interesting that Christianity is based on the fact that we cannot find a body, the body of Jesus Christ, but all of this Vatican City is built on the presumption that there is a body underneath there. So the excavations began. And uh, below the altar of the basilica was the top of Constantine's basilica. And it was a storage area, frankly, where a lot of things were stored. So they, they took all of that out and they began to dig. And as they dug, they got further into Constantine's basilica. But when they got below that, they hit the top of walls. And so they began to dig further and they found uh, pagan burials in cemeteries. And then below that, they discovered what they call the red wall and the graffiti wall. And on the graffiti wall, they discovered what's on the front of our communion table, the Cairo, the first few letters of uh, Christ's name. And then on the red wall, they found a Greek sentence that said something to the effect of Peter is within. Well, it's a fairly convoluted story, and I won't get into all the details, and things were probably not excavated the way they should have been. 
But within that wall was found a bag uh, with bones. And the bones were analyzed, and sure enough, they were from the time of Peter. And it was the bones of a man. And so they have put these bones uh, within silver containers that now sit within that wall area, that cavity. And uh, if you go on the Vatican website, you eventually maze your way through, through all this video to find that spot where Peter's remains, the supposed remains of Peter lie. Now, Peter, um, Peter was crucified. We know about his ministry uh, that's laid out in, in the Gospels. Um, we also have a sense that he evangelized in Antioch and ended up in Rome. We don't have a story of his martyrdom within our canon, within our scriptures, but there is a non-canonical book called The Acts of Peter, which records the martyrdom of Peter. And for many centuries, this, uh, the story of his martyrdom was actually pulled out of that Acts of Peter and distributed just the story of his death. But to make a long story short, what he was crucified for was he got in an argument with a couple of prominent Roman citizens about the importance of chastity. And this did not go well. Peter was arrested and condemned during the time of Nero to crucifixion. And as the legend goes, when he was about to be crucified, he said, I do not want to be crucified in the same manner that my Lord was crucified. And so the legend is that he was crucified upside down and his body was laid to rest on that Vatican field that I mentioned now, Peter, um, Peter has an interesting story once the Gospels end and the Acts of the Apostles begin, uh, and also from Paul in the book of Galatians, as I, I mentioned. Um, he, he goes out um, to Antioch, we are told, and he gets in an argument with Paul. And the issue at hand was Peter did evangelism or was known to do evangelism, continue doing it with the Jews. And Paul was commissioned to be with the Gentiles. But Peter was trying to balance his relationship with James, the brother of Jesus, who was in charge of the church in Jerusalem. And James was fairly convinced that one had to follow Jewish practice, things like circumcision, to continue to be a follower of Christ. And Paul was preaching something different. And so there was an argument between Peter and Paul in Antioch when Peter avoided talking to James about this controversy and avoided being welcoming to Gentiles, as Paul knew Peter had been. You see, there's a wonderful story in Acts of Peter having a vision from God and then going and having a conversation with a centurion named Cornelius, who was a Gentile, and God leading him to share the gospel with this man. So Paul knew that Peter was open open to his ministry, open to sharing the gospel with people outside the faith, but he was unwilling to confront James who had different views. And that's what created a conflict. You know, I had a friend in seminary who's now a preacher uh, for 20 years at a Baptist church in Trenton. And that preacher, often uh, Daryl's his name, would love to use the phrase betwixt and between. Peter, I think, was betwixt and between, kind of caught in the middle. I want you to, I, I, I want to get you involved in this. I'm going to say Peter was, and you say betwixt and between. You can add a little flavor if you want, get your preacher on. Peter was. Drag it out a little bit. Peter was. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's right, he was stuck. You got to drag that out a little bit. So I'm going to say that after I share a few stories about Peter. And I'm going to say Peter was. And you got to add a little enthusiasm, friends. So the story Debbie read about uh, this miraculous catch. Jesus goes to Peter and says, can I use your boat? And then he tells Peter to go out and cast the nets. And Peter said, Jesus, I've been fishing. We've been fishing all night. Why do you want me to do this now? Just cast it out, Peter. And when he does, the amount of fish are unbelievable. The boats are sinking. And Peter says, go away from me, Jesus. I am a sinful man. You see, Peter was reluctant. Then he did what Jesus said. Then he is so overcome by what he's seen. He says, go away from me. I am not worthy to be around you. Peter was. Peter was often the one that spoke to Jesus after the disciples heard a story or a parable that they didn't understand. And Peter would go to Jesus and say, we don't understand what's going on. And Jesus would get a little frustrated that they didn't understand. Peter was? Peter stepped out of the boat when he saw, or he thought he saw, his Lord coming. He had courage to step out from the safety of what he knew onto the water. But then he caught that wind and he fell in. But he immediately, instead of swimming to the boat himself, he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out his hand. But Peter was. Come on, Peter was. Peter was the one who said to Jesus, when Jesus asked who he was to the disciples, he said, you are the Messiah. And moments later, when Jesus was talking about his own suffering that would come, Peter rebuked him just moments after he had called Messiah. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. Don't prevent what I am supposed to do, Peter. Peter was. Peter was. Come on, choir. That's right. And when Jesus was having his last supper with all the disciples... He took off his outer garments and he began to wash their feet. And what did Peter do? Peter said, you're not washing my feet. I need to wash your feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, you have no part of me. What does Peter do? He says, well, wash the whole thing, Jesus. And Jesus says, I don't need to wash the whole thing. If I wash your feet, you are clean. Peter was. And then Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And those soldiers came to arrest him. And what did Peter do? He grabbed a sword. He wanted to defend his Lord. And he cut off the ear of one of those soldiers. And Jesus rebuked Peter and put his hand on that man's ear and healed it. Peter was. Peter then went on to deny his Lord three times. He said he wouldn't, but he did because Peter was. And then you know it. He ran to that tomb on Easter morning to see the body of Jesus because of all he had been through. Peter was. And then Jesus was cooking breakfast on that beach in John 21. We know that story. And one of the disciples recognized Jesus. And Peter jumped in the water and took off 
to have breakfast with his Lord again because he knew all he had been through. And Jesus pulled him aside and said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep three times to Peter. And Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. Peter is. Friends, I'm going to change it up on you. We are. We love Peter because we are betwixt and between as well. We love all these stories. We love the moments where he just gets it and the moments that he doesn't get it because that's our story. We have moments of brilliance where we understand who Christ is in our lives, Christ's grace. And we have moments where we resist, we fight, we want to do it our way because we are. And just like Peter, Christ does not abandon us. Just like the scriptures say, when we realize the wind is flowing and we begin to sink and we shout out, save me, it is the Christ who reaches down and grabs our hand, even in our betwixtness and our betweenness, and pulls us out. For we are. And Christ still loves us and calls us to discipleship. And all God's people shall say. <laughs>